Hello, everyone, and welcome to For Heads Sake, formerly known as Heads Up, the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, founder of Migraine Nation and chronic daily migraine survivor. I think you are all going to love our guest today. I am here with Dr. Trupti Gokhani. Hello, Dr. Gokhani. How are you? Hello, hello. I'm great. How are you? Great. Thank you for being here with us today. So Dr. Gokhani is a board certified neurologist and Ayurvedic expert. You may have seen her on the Dr. Oz show or on one of her many other speaking engagements. She has a very unique approach to how she discusses migraine. I think we can all benefit from hearing her approach and her viewpoints. I think everyone's going to love to hear what she has to say. Our topic today is what does my gut have to do with my migraine? So let's delve into this because I love to hear her talk. It's so interesting. So Dr. Gokhani, we hear the term gut-brain access thrown around all the time. Can you please explain to us what this is referring to? Sure, I'd love to, Lindsay. You know, the gut-brain access, when you think of the word access, Mm -hmm. access is a line. You know, it's like a line connecting Mm -hmm. two entities or two things you think of Mm -hmm. the hpa axis the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis so we know what that is like how those things work together the hypothalamus activates pituitary which activates the adrenals similarly the gut and the brain have an axis they have a connection of like almost like a line we can call the line the vagus nerve right and so when i think of the gut brain axis i'm thinking of that connection between the gut and the brain and that direct connection between the two okay so let's talk about the the, view, the way you present this. I love it. I've seen your talks. I've seen a number of your talks. And previously, I've heard you mention the three brains, which a lot of people are going to be like, what? I have one brain and it causes me all this pain. So, um, so you say that we need to take into account all three brains, not just the one up in our heads, if we really want to treat our migraine disease. Can you explain to us what the three brains are? Sure. And, you know, a lot of this came from working with patients for over two decades and doing my best to address what migraineurs really needed and migraine, those that suffer with migraine really needed to get to the root cause of their pain. Because at the end of the day, we have so many fabulous tools for pain, yet mm-hmm. we want to know why one struggles, what is the cause of it. And so right. focusing on the brain that we all think of as the brain, which is the central nervous system, the brain and the head was very limiting in my clinical mm-hmm. practice. And what I realized is the brain in the head is not working independently of the rest of the body. There yeah. is this direct connection between the brain, the first brain, which I'll call the central nervous system, mm-hmm. and the second brain, which is the enteric nervous system. That's the nervous system that's intrinsic to the gut. Okay. It's very well populated. There's like 200 to 600 million neurons in the enteric nervous system that's inside the gut. The third brain, which was coming up in my clinical practice was the microbiome. And I call brain, I'm using the term brain Mm -hmm. to define the center of intelligence, the operation system, Mm -hmm. the navigator of our human physiology. So if we focus on the brain and the head and say, that's the only thing operating us as humans, we're missing so much. Right. We're not going to then get to the root cause of migraine. I can promise you that because I've done this now for a couple of decades and I've watched where people want to fix the brain in the head, quiet that down. Yet if you don't take into account the other brains and their influence on the first brain, Mm -hmm. you won't get very far. Okay. So this is very interesting. And we're going to go into how this works and how they work together. I will say we are going to focus on the second and third brain that you referred to in this particular episode. We actually talk a lot about the first brain on this podcast. I don't just mean the brain's physiological role in migraine. We talk about the effect um, of our thoughts on our pain, of our thoughts on our migraine disease, our state of mind, et cetera. So we delve into that a lot. So in order to save time today, uh, we're going to focus on the second and the third brain that you just mentioned, because the enteric nervous system and the microbiome are pretty new topics to us on this show. So um, can you please go into a little more detail about um, the enteric nervous system first? Sure, sure. 
the mm -hmm. enteric nervous system when you really think about it and i feel like it's almost the forgotten part of who we are it went right. back, i think back to medical school training we didn't spend a lot of time on the ens i'll call it the ens for short right uh, because it just it, whether it was forgotten or not believed to be important or researched well for some reason the emphasis wasn't there so mm -hmm. the ENS, as I mentioned earlier, if you really think about this, 200 to 600 million neurons wow. in the enteric nervous system, which sits within our gut. That's right. more neurons than the, that's more than the neurons in the spinal cord. Okay. okay. Yet we talk about in neurology, the spinal cord is constantly a part of our conversation. When you're, tra you're trained in neurology, practicing neurology, I'm always thinking about the spinal cord and the, and the brain. When you think of the central nervous system as the brain and the spinal cord in the head, right? Right. Yet, the enteric nervous system in the gut is vastly innervated with neurons. It's responsible for pretty much every neurotransmitter that we make in the mm -hmm. body. It's 70% of the immune system lies within the gut, which is regulated by the ENS. It regulates the microglial cells. It regulates the macrophages. It regulates the immune system of the gut. Okay. The ENS helps the microbiome, the bacteria, create different types of byproducts and metabolites, such as short chain fatty acids, which actually support our gut and support the brain. So okay. the ENS in a nutshell is a vast network of neurons that's sitting within the gut that is almost, I call it the interplay. It kind of helps the bridge the gap between the brain of the head and okay. the microbiome. And okay. one more thing I wanna say is the ENS also, when you think about embryology, way back to embryology for those of us that have that training i want to just bring this up because it's important and those that don't just listen to this it's really fascinating when when the fetus is developing there's mm -hmm. this tissue called the neuroectodermal tissue and mm -hmm. this tissue as it migrates north in the fetus creates the central nervous system mm -hmm. as it migrates south creates the enteric nervous system okay. there is this direct link even in utero between these two systems Okay. I feel like it's a forgotten part of who we are and we want to emphasize what it is and why it's important. Okay. So how can this enteric nervous system be related to migraine? A lot of this information might sound so strange right now to our audience because it took us years to finally get to the point where we had data that showed us that uh, we had genes associated with migraine. And so many of those genes seem to be neurovascular in origin. So Many people listening are probably picturing migraine as a disease with a genetic tendency that occurs mostly above the shoulders, um, because this is this is how we are used to hearing about it. So, can you please uh, tell us how this enteric nervous system can be related to our migraine disease? Yeah. So, along that thinking, when you think of the genetics, the neurovascular mm -hmm. genetics, and the genetics that lead to migraine, I'd like us to think about the fact that again embryologically, the central nervous system and the enteric nervous system come from the same neuroectodermal cells. Okay. If that's the case, the genetics will affect both areas. Okay. So there's going to be a tie then between right. the central nervous system and the, the brain and the head and the brain and the gut. Okay. And so if you just kind of start to think about that, we can expand that genetics cannot just affect only one organ system yet may affect these two organ systems because there's an intimate relationship between okay. the two. And okay. specifically, if this helps the audience and yourself understand this, what has been actually found is that the enteric nervous system, I think this is absolutely fascinating, is a peripheral extension of the limbic brain, the feeling brain. Okay. So part of our brain up in our head feels yet we all have been there, the gut feels. You mm -hmm. feel it in the gut. You walk into a room, you feel something, or you're about to do a presentation or do this podcast or whatever. We feel a little something in the gut. Right. The gut has is the home of the feeling center. And okay. we can expand about that and talk about that and how that relates to migraine too. Okay. So let's move into, because I found this interesting in one of your talks. So I we know that maybe just slightly less than half of people with migraine also experience depression. So we are talking to a number of people who have migraine right now, who probably also have depression or a tendency toward depression or have experienced depression. So you had mentioned that there was a link between depression and the enteric nervous system. 
So can you talk to us about that? Yes, and so when you think about depression and specifically what we do know about depression, it's, it's multifaceted. There's a lot of things that are leaning towards the diagnosis of depression. One of them we know about is serotonin, that neurotransmitter that allows us to be happy and allows us right. to feel more lifted right in our moods. Right. Well, when you think about neurotransmitter production, 90% it's believed of serotonin production occurs at the gut okay. level. And so the, the neurotransmitter of serotonin, which is made as a gut, actually then regulates serotonin in the brain, in the head. This has been shown when you look at data, for example, high tryptophan diets, for example, tryptophan is converted into serotonin, mm. vitamin B6, and through some specific bacteria like lactobacillus that sit in the gut. Okay. okay. So- if your diet is high in tryptophan, you feel better. How does that happen? It's because the tryptophan in the gut, when it gets converted to serotonin, actually influences the serotonin in your brain. Okay. So when you think about depression, you think about migraine, you think about how do we get to the root cause of it? Part one is thinking about serotonin, but it gets more complicated than that. I wish it was that easy. <laughs> Part two is the neurotransmitters are produced by the bacteria in the gut. Okay. That goes to brain three. Okay. So it's not just getting more pure in your diet. That's great. Okay. It's also, can the bacteria convert the tryptophan? Do you have okay. the bacteria to convert the tryptophan? Okay. Now I want to get there because that's the third brain, the microbiome. But before we get there, can you tell us how we keep the enteric nervous system healthy? Incredible question. Really incredible question. And probably one of the toughest ones for, I think, a more Western audience and Western mm -hmm. providers to understand and answer. Mm -hmm. This is where I delve into Eastern medicine because the answer <laughs> is not found in Western medicine. Right. <laughs> so the ENS, what it also does is it regulates things. It regulates, you know, acid production, stomach acid mm -hmm. production. It regulates the motility of the gut. Mm -hmm. It regulates our digestive enzyme production. The ENS is responsible for keeping the gut working. If you think about it that way, right? Mm -hmm. And it's doing this, remember, it's doing this in conversation with your first brain, and your thinking right. patterns, and your microbiome. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of, we call it the top down, bottom up approach. All of these systems are talking to each other, that access again. There's this conversation being had. Mm -hmm. If I'm really upset and angry, my thought is going to influence the action of my gut. Mm -hmm. If I'm scared and nervous, my gut might go into spasm because my right. brain is saying, don't eat right now, run from the bear. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the ENS and you think about how it's operating, what's fascinating and how to balance it, starting with what we talked about in the beginning, which I'm glad you talked about in this podcast, let's think about <laughs> the thinking patterns we have. Right. How are we processing stress? How do we handle stress? What is our program? What is our belief system? I do a lot of work with that because if I'm always seeing danger, my gut is always going to be turned off for processing okay. foods. And I'm going to probably make some bad bacteria down there because my, my mindset is allowing the virulence factors of the gut to change, which allows pathogenic bacteria to grow. So how do you balance the ENS was your first question you asked me. I think the most important thing is balancing your first brain, your mind, and your thought patterns, getting rid of any thoughts and baggage that's not working for you. Right. Second thing is to start to connect with your emotional body. This is something I found in my clinical practice. I never really did. Honestly, as a neurologist, we're not taught to go into the emotional body. That's for the psychiatrist mm -hmm. to do, isn't it? For the mm -hmm. therapist. Well, no, that's not the way it should be done. We've got to evolve the model. We mm -hmm. as clinicians and providers need to start asking about emotional health and not just say, hey, go see the therapist. We should actually start to understand what is happening, what is maybe being repressed and suppressed. A lot of my patients I've worked with over the years, and now I do more coaching than I do doctoring because I feel like this is a really important area, is mm -hmm. what are you holding on to? Mm -hmm. what, are you, what are you really angry about? What, what, is, what is the message behind the pain from an emotional right. level? What right. are you not getting in your life that you really want? And when you start to get to the emotional body, that actually starts to open up the enteric nervous system and balance it. And then we use circadian medicine, which is a part of Ayurveda. Align yourself with the sun and the moon. Get up at the same time. Get to bed at the same time. Start having lunch as your biggest meal. When you start to get connected with the sun, the daylight mm -hmm. pattern, the day, day, nighttime pattern, you're actually, your emotional system, your, your ability to connect with your emotions is going to become much more elaborate. 
mm-hmm. then you become what I call intuitive. You become intelligent down there. You mm-hmm. kind of know to say yes or no to the food or yes or no to that person or activity because you're like, ah, that's not going to work. I'm trigger a migraine. Right. That's really cool when that happens. Right. So you're right. That is very, very different from what we normally hear, what we see data on. It is going to sound odd to a lot of people who are used to hearing uh, Western medicine links to migraine, but it is something we have started talking a lot about when it comes to pain, thought processes, et cetera. We talk a lot about cognitive behavioral therapy, things like that, um, and how it has an effect and meditation has an effect uh, on our migraine. It, we have never talked about uh, the enteric nervous system. We only talk about our first brain, um, as you call it. So this is this is interesting. We have never brought these other thoughts into it before. Um, so I, I love I love hearing hearing this view. Um, so something I I would like to move into. So now we want to go into the third brain, uh, or as you call it, which is our microbiome, um, because it's this is all linked in in the philosophy that you're bringing to us today. Um, so talk a little bit about the microbiome and um, tell us how it can be related to migraine. So the microbiome, it's its so fascinating, right? It's this, uh, some believe it's its own organ system. It's this complex community of microbes and bacteria, viruses, fungi that are within us, that are around us. The We have a microbiome of the skin. We have the microbiome of so, so many areas of the body. And right. it is believed that we're more bacteria than we are human cells, right? <laughs> so within the gut, which is kind of a scary thing, thank God they're a lot smaller <laughs> than the human right, cells. Right. So um, we think of the microbiome of the gut, you know, there's a hundred trillion bacteria, right? And mm-hmm. these different um, microbiota. What they're doing down there is they literally have control over kind of who we are. Meaning that if you have a healthy microbiome, you're mm-hmm. going to feel healthy. You're going to feel optimal. You're going to make your neurotransmitters like serotonin. You're going to support your immune system when you get these viruses that hit you. Your mm-hmm. body can defend itself. Okay. So for me, the microbiome is like our inner little kind of thinkers that Mm -hmm. are, that are navigating the foods that are coming in, that are navigating the toxins that are coming in, navigating pathogens and saying, what do I do with them? And it's our first line of defense, right? So the challenge I believe happens over the course of time with migraine, first and foremost, the medications, let's be honest, when you're taking a lot of anti-inflammatories, when you're taking medications and foods that can unfortunately worsen the microbiome, like high sugar diets, for example, Mm -hmm. you're going to end up having a weaker protective system. And thus you're going to unfortunately not make the neurotransmitters and the immune system that you need to protect yourself from from migraine. Um, CGRP, if I could throw this out there, CGRP is made in the gut. You know, CGRP helps with gastric motility. CGRP, Mm -hmm. we know a lot of these tools that are the Western tools for migraine block CGRP. Mm -hmm. And so the question we want to ask is, what is the microbiome doing in terms of protecting us from migraine, and how does it really influence pain, and how can we balance it uh, when it comes to migraine? Right. So you have mentioned um, in some of your previous. Uh, work that there is a link between the microbiome and the HPA axis. Again, that's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that you mentioned before. What is the link here? We we mentioned that there is a link with the enteric nervous system. What is the link with the microbiome? So there's some interesting studies that have been looking at this and what specifically the microbiome does with the HPA axis. And what's been found is that when you have uh, for example, stress before you go in for surgical procedure, they mm-hmm. will find that we'll start with top down, you thinking a stressful thought can actually increase the amount of pseudomonas bacteria, which actually makes you more inflammatory and may have a more challenging time responding and basically um, recovering from the surgery. Mm-hmm. Because what happens then is the bacteria itself creates an increase in cytokines, inflammatory peptides at the gut level, like interleukin-1 and 6 and interleukin-8. And all these, unfortunately, inflammatory cytokines can make it harder for our immune system to settle down after surgery. Mm. Second, so that's from top down, first brain down to third. How about bottom up? 
if you're carrying some imbalanced bacteria. And there's been some studies looking specifically at migraine and diversity of bacteria, mm -hmm. because there's this thing called alpha diversity and beta diversity. That's how many different types of organisms are hanging out down there in the digestive system. If you have a, a smaller diversity, a lessened diversity of bacteria, you may not then have the bugs that are making things like serotonin or making the structuring fatty acids I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. And thus, you're more prone to migraine. Mm -hmm. So that actually, there is some like early data looking at that. We want to have more research in this area. Gosh, I'm hoping we're going to get more research in this area. Yet you can start seeing there's trends towards if your bacteria profile of the gut isn't really robust, um, you're unfortunately not going to then do the housekeeping functions you do in the gut to protect yourself from having the migraine in the first place. Okay. And so one of the things I'm finding in a lot of my microbiome testing, when I test my coaching clients, I see that a lot of people are lacking diversity. It's kind of universal, to be honest with you. Right. Yeah. And we want to fix that. Okay. So I have an interesting question. I'm wondering if there's data behind this certain thought. Um, you have brought up previously that um, dysbiosis, as you call it, meaning an imbalance in our microbiome, um, is thought to be associated with the production of various cytokines, various pro-inflammatory mediators, et cetera. And you had mentioned that one of these could be CGRP, which we all know is related to migraine. Do we have any data that dysbiosis is related to CGRP production or is just this just the thought of something that could happen? So I did do a search earlier today to see if there was anything before happened on this. I am not seeing anything very okay. clearly, clearly okay. linked and good enough in terms of a study to refer to. Uh, I actually emailed someone this morning saying, shall we study this? We should. Yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. think there's some challenges, right? CGRP is a very short half-life, right? It's in the system mm -hmm. very, so number one, measuring CGRP and doing it accurately and properly. And the second mm -hmm. thing is... Um, we have to make sure we're testing it the right way. There's so many ways right now to test the microbiome. I use a very specific test. Um, there's there's a lot of discussion out there on which one is the best test to test your microbiome, what kind of specific you know, way to test these organisms and how do we make sure we're capturing it in the most um, reliable way mm -hmm. so you can retest and see the same results. And so thankfully there's a lot of conversation in that area. And I think we'll have some really strong clear thoughts on that very soon. Okay. Um, but that those are two things, I think, wh why we're not right there, but we're getting close, right? Because okay. it's like, we know we need to do this. So let's just get the best testing and let's kind of figure out the best way to really checking CGRP levels. Um, though, I can tell you this, there's some big things that just to think about. Diversity okay. is diversity. If your diversity is low, you're mm. most likely going to be making more inflammatory cytokines, which is probably going to be just linked to you becoming, yeah, exactly, having more right. CGRP. And then if you're missing some key strains, we call them the keystone bacteria. Mm -hmm. These are the ones that like, if you don't have those keystone bugs, a lot of housekeeping function isn't done. So okay. lactobacillus, bifidol, these key strains, rosemary, these are very key strains that you just really should have in the mm -hmm. gut, um, which I do believe if you can, Make sure you have those seven, eight strains, probably going to be reducing your inflammatory processes in the gut. Okay. And so, so if we can even target diversity in keystone bacteria and make sure mm -hmm. that that is healthy, probably going to see that CGRP is linked there, you know? Okay. All mm -hmm. right. Um, so this is, this is a big deal for me. And this is something we bring up on this podcast all the time. I think a lot of the reason that physicians, when they talk to people with migraine and chronic pain about their thoughts and their pain or cognitive behavioral therapy, et cetera, the reason it falls flat is it comes across as the reason we're in pain is, uh, we somehow failed mentally or emotionally, we did something wrong. And I always argue that um, I think it's the opposite. I think we have to be superheroes at this. Um, we have to be superheroes at handling our emotions. We have to be superheroes at the um, mental and emotional uh, tools uh, because we have this migraine tendency. That's sort of how I look at it. So this question, it, it's almost like a chicken or the egg thing for me. Um, so I'm curious to know, um, is it your belief that the gut is the origin of migraine or do you believe that we have migraine and then the gut makes our problem worse? Yes. You know, it's, um, it's a really interesting 
conversation to have of which came first. And I always refer to Eastern medicine. It's 5,000 years old, specifically Ayurvedic medicine, which is what I use a lot in my clinical practice and my coaching practice. And Ayurvedic medicine says this, and it's mm -hmm. like I said, it's 5,000 years old. It's believed to be the first system of healing known to mankind is that we have a tendency when it comes to disease mm -hmm. to imbalance the gut first. And it may be inherently that the gut is more prone mm -hmm. to creating imbalances quickly, such as mm -hmm. food intolerances may not respond well to certain exposures as easily because of the, we call it not just genetic, but energetic kind of state that one is born into. Right. But what doesn't help that is that they don't separate in Eastern medicine. They don't separate the, the physical and the emotional. Right. So what I mean by that is that if let's say you're born into, we call it, there's like three natures, the, the excitable, the, the windy type, the fiery type and the earthy type to make it really simple. Mm -hmm. If you're more of an excitable type individual and personality mm -hmm. ever, you just naturally, let's say you are, that's just utter, we're, we're born into one of these three types. It's just not, you know, it's something mm -hmm. that we're born into. So let's say I'm more of an excitable type, I'm the windy buff type. Well, then an external stressor for me, I just naturally may get more excitable. I may start to feel anxious with that. Mm -hmm. The fear in my mind will tell my gut energetically to go into spasm, go into freeze state. My mm -hmm. neck gets tight. My shoulders get tight. I get a little tension headache and my my, I get constipated. Now that whole state, the freeze state, there is no absolutely no blame that I went into that state. We should never look at that and say that I'm there's something wrong with me. No, it's what your state is. Your state naturally has a tendency to go there when mm -hmm. you see danger. The, the, the question I always ask someone that has a lot of freeze responses when they stay on often and maybe for too long is what was the early program that was given to you by your community, mm -hmm. by your parents, maybe even by your church that made you go into state so easily and readily. And again, this happens at a subconscious level. Between right. zero to seven, you know, between zero to seven, we're all operating in a theta brainwave pattern. The subconscious, the theta, theta is it's almost like you're in a trance state mm -hmm. between zero to seven. Okay. So when someone says around you, the world is a dangerous place, the world is a dangerous place and repeats that to you every day, or you're hearing yeah. it on the news, or you're hearing it from someone elsewhere, you take that in like a sponge and you believe it as your truth. You right. didn't do that consciously. Mm-hmm. So, so how can one blame someone for that? That's that's something that was a subconscious absorption. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So later in life then, because of that early program, you may react a little bit more readily to something that another person may not view as dangerous, but you view it as dangerous. Mm -hmm. So what comes first? Is it the mind or the gut? Are you about that isn't separated? It really okay. doesn't because it's all, we call it an energetic shift. We go into a mind state and a physiological state together there isn't okay. a separation that the emotions are doing one thing the gut is doing another it's basically your entire system goes into what i call as a state okay. and the fire state is more the angry the heated and mm -hmm. that's more reflux and more um inflammatory and the earth is more of a depressed drawn in it's like the flight response i'm going to hide so it's all about thinking about what is your nature which state do you go into and then asking yourself what is your early program? I, I, so the reason this question is interesting to me is there's some of us, I'm one of them, and I think there's many of us on the podcast that think that most of our stress came from migraine and the pain. So I had daily migraine from the time I was four, and most of my life stress was incessant pain. So, and so I find it interesting. I'm always curious because I do see people that, you know, even if they chronify as adults, their personality, their pain, their health goes straight downhill. And I do feel like a lot of the stress comes from the migraine itself. Yeah. And I agree with you on that. And I would ask the question, and I'm always curious about when a migraine begins at a very young age, my daughter was getting headaches when she was five. I've read right. about this in my, in my Mysterious Mind book. I talked about this. And the, the thing that happened with my daughter, which was, I think things happen absolutely for a reason. And she kind of had to get those headaches when I was in a headache practice, a migraine practice. It was like juxtaposition of working with the patient and getting a phone call from Mrs. M at school mm -hmm. saying your daughter has a headache and I've got a headache patient in front of me. It was a fascinating thing, right? For me as a mother. And mm -hmm. what I realized the reason she was getting those headaches was because it was for me to explore the why behind them at age five. Mm -hmm. And what I found with her 
is, and I wrote about this in my book, is that she had digestive issues that I didn't even recognize. Mm -hmm. She was really high in tolerance with dairy, eggs, and gluten, which is what I was giving her that she's 20 years old now. So 15 mm -hmm. years ago, that was the mainstay. Wheat right. was supposed to be, you know, white bread made you dead. And then wheat was supposed to be healthy, right? And so I was giving her wheat bread all the time. Was mm -hmm. that line, the whiter the bread, the faster the, was some, there was some line I remember, <laughs> and the milk, milk was good. Do you remember those commercials on TV with the milk? Yeah, yes, yes. So the program that we even had as a community was to give everyone wheat. Wheat was better mm -hmm. and better for you than white bread. Um, that uh, milk was good. You know, mm -hmm. we all the celebrities on TV with the milk mustaches. Like, right. We were programmed as society to believe those things were good for us. So okay. I would give my daughter mozzarella cheese stick at lunchtime and then give her milk in the morning with her cereal. And I did her food intolerance testing and found out she was off the charts for pretty much everything I was giving her. So right. what I'm getting at is the early age migraine. What I realized it didn't start at age five, mm -hmm. right? What it started with was me. When I was pregnant with her, I was chief resident. I had a 24 seven pager. I was answering calls all the time. Mm -hmm. And I was studying for my board exams and mm -hmm. I had um, maybe one insured drink a day as my meal mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's all I could grab at the hospital. I was mm -hmm. absolutely stressed out. We know the in utero experience is really important for the fetal development and for the baby when they're born. Mm -hmm. So I'll take full ownership that I was a really stressed out mom. Mm -hmm. And so I, unfortunately, at that time as a pregnant woman, was not taking care of myself. So unfortunately, I gave that kind of to my daughter. Right. So what we want to do is explore. How was mom? How was mom's health? How was her mental health? How was her stress? And then when you were born, what was your diet like? What did you eat? What was the program around you? There's so much there that I think if we explore that, we actually start to see some answers as to like why you got your headaches at age four. Right. And with my daughter, this is a beautiful end of the story. Took her off those foods. Headaches went away. She's been pain-free for 15 years. Okay. okay. But it took a lot of deep work to figure that out. It wasn't like I figured this wasn't in the neurology textbooks. I can promise you that. Right. Um, so I, there is a question that I would really like to know, uh, what your philosophy and background feels about this, because the traditional answers have really never felt right to me. For those of us who experience uh, nausea and vomiting with our migraines, some of it, sometimes it can be violent. Sometimes it can be almost never ending. Um, and, and so I am so curious with your background and training, if you have a theory regarding why so many of us experience nausea and vomiting with our migraine disease. Yes, I do. And I'd love to give you the theory from the Eastern perspective and the Western. Okay. okay. Throw both theories out there. So okay. Eastern perspective, mm -hmm. nausea and vomiting are linked to, remember those three states, the excitable state, right. the fired up state, and the earthy state. Right. Fire, it's called pizza, fire energy. When mm -hmm. you have a collection of fire energy, you're too heated. You're mm -hmm. energetically pizza in nature. What does mm -hmm. that, what does that look like in terms of a personality? Um, someone that's more driven, more focused, more direct, someone that is more competitive and likes to a little bit more muscular in their uh, in their build. Mm -hmm. Pitta individuals, Pitta is linked to fire. It's that ability to see things and get things done. Right. In balance, it's a fabulous energy to have as your main leading energy if you're born with that nature. Mm -hmm. Out of balance, too much fire, it collects in our system and energetically can create a fiery gut, heated okay. gut which okay. is nausea and vomiting and a mm -hmm. heated head. And you call someone hot-headed? Okay, hot-headed, that's angry. Right, okay. So heat collects and it turns from energy to physiology, right? Mm -hmm. So the energetic answer is too much fire, okay? The more Western answer of what that is, is when you look at the actual dyno dynamics of the microbiome, um, there's something called LPS. I'm not sure if your listeners mm -hmm. have, okay, lipopolysaccharide. They probably don't, it's lipopolysaccharide. So you, you want to explain it? to them what that is? Sure. So we yeah. have about, you know, 60% of the bacteria in the gut um, are gram negative bacteria. They're just mm -hmm. a certain kind of bacteria. And they have this outer coating known as LPS, lipopolysaccharide, right. which is the outer coating. It's very common that the bacteria kind of are formed and die off and they're constantly growing and dying. And we have this release of LPS in the gut, very natural because the bacteria are dying off. Mm -hmm. That part is normal for every single one of us. What's not physiologically normal is when the LPS moves from within the lumen of the gut into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't go there. It should stay in the lumen of the gut. And then we make this antibody called secretory IgA, 
which binds to the LPS if we have a healthy immune system in the gut, and it pulls the LPS out of our bodies into the elimination. When you have a bowel movement, you clear mm. out LPS. Well, number one, let's say you don't make the SIGA. Then the LPS is free floating around. Okay, if it's free floating, maybe it can still get out through your daily poop. Well, okay. what if you have something called leaky gut, which is now believed to be a true clinical entity. It's called in increased intestinal permeability. It's mm -hmm. basically the tight junctions of the, the lumen of the gut, you know, kind of move apart. So what's in the lumen makes its way out into the bloodstream, into the circulation. Not good out there because LPS, when it moves from within the gut into the bloodstream, can go to places it shouldn't go. With me so far? Yep. Cool. So then when the LPS is moving into bloodstream, this is, I'm going to get to the nausea conversation. What it does is it moves its way into a place called the dorsal motor vagal nucleus. Okay. okay. It moves into this vagal complex, hangs out there where it shouldn't be. Okay. LPS is not allowed to be there, but it goes there because it's like, oh, I can go float around the body and find places to lodge into goes there and what is why is that important when it's found in that dorsal vagal complex ready for this it yeah. impairs the communication from the first brain to the enteric nervous system to the gut oh, okay the first brain has to regulate with the enteric nervous system gastric motility as we talked about before right but when lps is hanging out in that dorsal motor vagal nucleus mm -hmm. not to say i'm trying to think of an acronym to say it faster but <laughs> when it's when it's when it's there you lose connection between the gut and the brain. You get what we call gastroparesis, slowing up the okay. gut. So I think, you know, just to conclude, what I'd like to add is that, you know, we, we have this really fascinating area of research of the microbiome, the enteric nervous system, which I believe is that uncharted, unexplored territory. And if we can spend some time understanding the dynamics of not only how that triggers migraine, yet how to balance the enteric mm -hmm. nervous system, like you asked earlier, and how to balance out the microbiome, I think we have some incredibly powerful tools to help with the migraine condition. Um, right. I've seen it firsthand with working with my own kids and working with a lot of patients that we start to work the thoughts and the thinking head, you know, the first brain, the second brain, the feeling, clear the emotions, don't suppress them, understand what they're there for, why they're, right. why they're coming up and then get intuitive, start to understand the second brain from an intuitive level. Are you listening to your intuition? Are you following your truth? You know, mm -hmm. and then the third brain, the microbiome, are you looking at your digestive system? Are you monitoring your poops? I know that sounds something that people don't want to look at. You want to flush the toilet and not think about it, but <laughs> are you actually paying attention to what you're eliminating every day? We do that when babies are little. We don't do it when we get older. We kind of think it's all gross to do, but this is mm -hmm. actually, again, back to Ayurveda. People actually ask, what do your poops look like? No. What's the color? What do they smell like? And uh -huh. that's a really important reflection of your internal health and your well-being. So okay. um, there's a lot here, really exciting times I think we're in and we can research this and hopefully have some really nice answers okay. to get to the cause of migraine. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for being here today. And thank you for bringing this new viewpoint to us that we've just never had before. And um, thank you everyone for joining us on this week's episode of For Head's Sake. Please join us again next week on the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. Goodbye, everyone.